Hello, this is Pat Lynch, and you're listening to the Career Pathways Podcast. Uh, Today, I'm uh, going to be talking with Dustin Bork, Professor of Art at Lyon College. And uh, as always, before we get to uh, learn more about Dustin, always give a shout out to our all-star podcasting team. We have... Gavin Brunson. And... Jason Nichols, producer Jason. Producer Jason, way back, making the magic happen on the magic board. So, Dustin, hello. Welcome, thanks. Oh, yeah, this is long overdue. Uh, we always start out the podcast with just a general question about just tell us about yourself, kind of where you're from, you know, kind of where you went to school, kind of how you, and then kind of all that leading up to how did you end up here at Lyon College? Great question. Yeah, it's nice to talk to a fellow Michigander as well. So I grew up in Monroe, Michigan. So if you're from Michigan, you can do this. I'm pointing at my hand right now in the shape of Michigan. Michigan is the only state that can give you a high five. Yeah. So I'm from Monroe. I went to school at the University of Michigan. You're a fellow Michigander and another Wolverine. Go blue. Uh, I grew up in what they call the uh automaton alley which is kind of the very uh blue collar uh, a lot of ford factories and yeah, my uh, dad worked at woodhaven stamping i know right that, the I yeah. know it was like then, 20 minutes from my house yeah and then yeah, yeah then monroe yeah, had a uh, assembly plan also yep for yeah. ford as well and uh so i grew up in a town that i don't think it was a common pathway to wind up in art <laughs> or be an artist. And uh, I was fortunate, though, that I had my parents' encouragement. And I yeah. think that getting my start in art was sort of like subversive or, or rebellious, mm-hmm. right? And uh, found that not only you can do it to mess with people's minds, but right. also to kind of add value and be creative and stand out. And I was fortunate to be able to go to school for it and wind up getting a career in art, but I went to the University of Michigan, graduated in 99, and then went on to graduate school at Indiana University. And uh, both of those were degrees were focused in fine arts, but specifically in printmaking. And I really enjoy not just the aspect of making art, but the kind of collaborative idea of art. And so I think printmaking is a good center for that because, you know, typically printmakers don't have their own facility. It's a lot of expensive equipment. But define printmaking. Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, I started printmaking really young, actually, um, that that, uh, I had an opportunity in high school to do a marketing co-op. So you'll enjoy this. And I remember my high school teacher said that, you know, as a result of this class, that part of the cooperative element was that he would place you in sort of an internship and then you could get a job out of it. And he said, what career do you want to go into? And for me, you know, thinking kind of art and rebellious and subversive, like you're like a rock star or something. I was like, give me an art job. In this small town of like 50,000 people, good luck. You know, I, he said he'd never been stumped before. Like he's always, he was always able to place people where they wanted to be. Cause usually it was like nursing health, you know, it was something like I want to be in a, in a business kind of setting, but he found me a gig. He found me a gig at a, at a a screen printing place. And so I helped at this t-shirt place, uh, First, just cleaning screens, then helping to make the screens. Learned a lot about color mixing and printmaking before a lot of other artists maybe even were experienced with that. But and then I went to graduate. When I went to undergraduate, I, I really loved it. And a lot of students maybe had done painting or drawing, mm-hmm. and printmaking was a little bit more uh, nebulous what it was. But right. uh, generally, with a print, you have some sort of a matrix. That's the surface that you're printing off mm-hmm. of. So for woodcut, it would be wood. For lithography, it would be stone. Yeah. Etching is metal, and screen printing mm-hmm. is used to be silk. That's where the silk screen yeah. comes from. But uh, that's the matrix. And then you have some sort of press or pressure. In the case of screen printing, it's the squeegee mm-hmm. that you're pushing the ink through the um, through the screen with 
woodcut or etching, you're probably running it through a press or using hand pressure. And then you always have like ink and paper. And so the nice thing about printmaking is with a painting, you can you sell one. Right. Drawing, you can sell one. You know, one exists framed on a wall somewhere. But with printmaking, you can make multiples. And so right. I really enjoyed that aspect of it and being able to see different ways of reproducing your work to get it disseminate it there out into the world in a, in a bigger way. Yes. So then uh, Indiana. Mm-hmm. So, so then you decided not to become a full-time Hoosier. And then you, <laughs> what, what was next after that? So I, well, first of all, you asked how, like how I got to Lyon college. Yeah, like yeah. Well, I fell in love with teaching. I remember when I was an undergrad, yeah. our, my mentors would always say, don't think about teaching. Like, that seems kind of cruel. Like, don't even think about it. I'm like, well, trust me, I'm not going to even think about it because I'm going to be a famous artist. Yeah. Why would I teach, right? right. And, the, I, and, and no, seriously, don't even think about it. I just, dude, I just told you I'm not thinking about it. I'm thinking about being a famous artist right. and I don't want to teach. And, and then because they were trying to prevent a scenario where there was just students that expected when they graduated, right. they would get a teaching gig Yeah. because they were sort of, you know, hard and competitive and if you could do other things do other things but it was only in graduate school that i had opportunity with a fellowship to um, be the instructor of record for a class 2d design was the first class i taught and i loved it fell in love and i and i and i thought then like why were they telling me not to do this they wanted to hold on to this gift the secret themselves and i at that point decided you know i'm going to do whatever it takes to become a teacher yeah because i love it and i want to dedicate my life to this. Right. And so right out of uh, grad school, you know, I remember going to like TJ Maxx and buying a bunch of ties. So all these interviews that I was going to get for all these jobs, <laughs> you know, they're going to be knocking on the door. Right, and right. I've sent my application probably to 30 different schools right. and nothing, just yeah. no, no, not even a yeah. response. Right. A little bit longer. I did get, you know, an interview <laughs> chance to wear i don't you, you could wear one tie to 12 different interviews but i thought i'm gonna have 12 interviews i need 12 different ties yeah, right yeah. so i finally got a chance to wear <laughs> one of those ties and uh, didn't get the gig and you know moved kind of back home yeah and when i when i moved back home i got the opportunity to teach at the university of toledo first as an adjunct and thought i'll do this for a little while and then figure out how to just maybe teach part-time make art as a career and and then i just had fell into the position where they liked me enough. They're like, we want to keep you, which yeah. is pretty rare. Usually adjuncts yeah. are, are, you know, very temporary. Don't get full-time gigs out of it. And so I was there for seven years, really wanted a tenure track job, yeah. rolled the dice, yeah. applied a lot of different places, got the job here at Lyon and been here ever since. That's 2010. Been yeah. here for 14 years. Amazing. Well, uh, so what classes do you, do you teach here at Lyon? Cause yeah, I know it varies as far as the curriculum, you know, Yes, the benefit of being at a small liberal yeah. arts college like Lyon is that when I first started teaching, I mentioned 2D design was the first class yeah. that I taught. That's what I was going to be teaching just that at Toledo. So, you know, teaching eight classes a year and they were going to be all just that same class. Got the opportunity, though, to teach, like, just keep asking, can I teach a drawing class? Can I teach a primming class? And, you know, shout out to Barbara Miner, who was the foundations coordinator who hired me that allowed me to teach more classes and then also my friend Arturo Rodri- Rodriguez, who uh, said, you know, he he was teaching all the printmaking classes. He, I know you like printmaking. I know you want to teach some printmaking classes. And if you're going to be applying to other gigs, it would be good for you to have some experience. So he didn't have to do this. It was very generous right. of him. Yeah. And I really always think back to how pivotal that was for him to allow me to, you know, teach one of those printmaking classes. And then it was like, oh, you're doing a great job. Right. Your class is pretty popular. Teach another printmaking class. And so that really widened broadened my experience, but also made me a lot more marketable, wow. hireable. Right? Now, the art curriculum here at Lyon, we obviously have printmaking, what other, what other, what yeah, other we got, courses? Well, so some of the classes I've taught include painting, drawing, printmaking, 2D design, it's my favorite class, uh, some art history classes, yep. and then teaches, those are the classes that I generally teach. I also teach the Core 100. I love teaching year one. This past year, taught it as creativity which I'm kind of envisioning could be for any student, not just our majors. And uh, then my colleagues like Jamie teaches ceramics, yep. some sculptural, Maggie teaches some sculptural classes, intro to visual arts and, and theater tech classes. That's kind of, really, we have a lot of different options, a lot of different <coughs> types of classes. That students yeah. I take. love that core 100 uh, student presentation. Cause that's kind of in, in a way exactly what I'm trying to do in the lion building by, 
populating it with all the student art and kind of turning it into a gallery. And, and it just, it's a different environment every day when you can walk by just something that's original and inspiring and just, and versus, you know, just poster art or bulletin boards, you know, it, yeah, and there's studies that show it. that yeah. color can inspire, color can increase creativity yep. and retention of information. So schools that will paint a hallway bright colors or patterns or shapes are more likely to have student success yeah. than if they are neutral, uh, institutional type looking and even just surrounding with art. So I love that opportunity. I think that is a good case of where people might not notice their surroundings unless we're forcing them to yeah. stop and think and see things differently because there's art there. All right. Those were the easy questions. Oh no, I got some tough <laughs> ones. <laughs> no, 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 this is a, a, yeah, there was a, a bad lead in, but, <laughs> but how do you teach art? You know, it's just, it's, it's like, you know, do, do uh, students have it or don't have it or everybody has it to a degree and, and you, uh, how do you, you know, you get, get creativity out, out of those students? I, it always, I, I, I never it, had an, like an answer or an idea how that's done. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that it's so different for everybody. Yeah. And there's this uh, assumption that art is only for the gifted and a genius yes. and yeah. that it's innate. You have it or you don't. And teaching, for instance, this semester I taught drawing one last semester drawing two this semester people will come in and say I'm not I can't draw right right it's just another way of thinking it's another way of communicating and everybody can get better at drawing right. but there's also so many different types of drawing there's so many different types of art right. so one person might gravitate towards digital art or photography and that's a gift and that's a yeah. sort of a vision and a certain way of seeing and communicating painting is another and, you know, you could have a painter like, uh, you know, Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel, right. but then you also have an artist that you might be familiar with, like Keith Haring, drawing directly yeah. on the subway walls that is more cartoony. Are, are they, is one better than the other? They're both art. They're both different ways right. of thinking. And so if so when someone says, I can't draw or I can't paint, they're thinking only that one model of like, it has to look realistic. It has to be naturalistic. And so, yes, you can teach art. Mm -hmm. Yes, everyone can draw. And the for me, the approach really is just opportunities. Right. There are so many opportunities that you can take advantage of where students get interested in a particular material right. or even subject matter and explore that. It's like research. And the more you spend time on it, the more you're going to kind of find your niche and what interests you and what, even if it's really weird yeah. or esoteric, if it's some weird thing, there's going to be some weirdo out there that's also interested in it. And yeah. it's just finding your audience. So because you've taken them. our classes, yes, Gavin. So how, how did the process work for you? Well, <laughs> to agree with what Bork said, I, I always come in saying I can't draw because I right. cannot draw. I maybe can do like stick figures. Right. But, that's the type of drawing. <laughs> <laughs> but with, um, with uh, Miss Smithson's class, she really allowed us to like go out and um, do different types of like art. Like uh, there was one project where everybody else was drawing, and I made a hoodie, and I was like, "That's mm -hmm. like I can I can do that, so I can make that look good." Yeah. So that's my experience with art class. Just different avenues you can make your art. Yeah, it, that's great. Is catching students at this point in their life? Or is there is there still creativity there? Because I kind of have the suspicion that, I don't know, the world around us kind of will beat the creativity out of you eventually. Is I think that, that's part of it is like when, yeah. when, you, when you're younger yeah. and there's the right way of doing things yeah. and there's kind of like you're graded to make sure that it's done correctly. Mm -hmm. But instead, I think it's not always, it's not always the quality. It can be the process. If, if you trust the process, if you're making the attempt and you're learning, mm -hmm. who's to say that it has to look a certain way, right? right? To know that you checked that box and you learned how to cross hatch or you learned how to shade. There's some very objective based things that you can, you know, draw a sphere and make it look mm -hmm. spherical, make it look right. like it's three dimensional and, and, and it has a light source. Mm -hmm. That's an objective thing, but we're not trying to teach everybody to draw the same exact way 
everybody sees the world differently. Everyone has their own perspective. So we learn these different tools and techniques so that they can apply them so that they can see what direction they want to take them. And it would be really boring and monotonous if everybody wound up making the same thing. Right. right? So when they come in, I think that it maybe is a surprise mm -hmm. because some of the high school mentality too is let's spend six weeks on one project and it's, they're all going to be good when we're done. That's a little bit easier than in six weeks, we're going to make six projects and you're going to learn six different things from yeah. and trust the process and don't worry about if it's perfect. We got a long time to make a perfect masterpiece. So you, oh, go ahead, Gavin. Okay, I just wanted to like yeah. piggyback and like, yeah, off what Pat said. He said that, um, do you think there's like at this point in time, like the creativity is being like beaten out of people, like you said, with all the things going on and stress and whatnot. I want to contradict that and say, do you think this is a time where people are their most creative? Like, so you got to bring it out of them. Mm -hmm. Because everybody sees certain something different in a different way. Like this podcast, we see it as a podcast. Someone else can see it as like like opportunity to learn about definitely work in art. So, do you think at this point, through your classes, that you have students that like are like them hidden gems? Exactly. And once you bring them out, they're like exactly, definitely, a hundred percent. I mean, some of the students would take a class like you did with, with Ms. Smith and where it was like, this is one class, just an opportunity for me to take an art class or taking intro to visual arts because it's a core requirement. And next thing they know, it's like, I see myself making art. I see myself being creative yeah. or a student that maybe is taking one art class, but they're a psychology major. And then they realize there's art therapy is an option. They could double major or even mm -hmm. minor in art right. major in psychology. And uh, I love when, when, when a student says, I never thought I would be able to do this, that is such a satisfying, like, gratif that's like instant gratification for them producing a tangible thing. But for me also seeing that it awakened something in them that they didn't think they could do. And now they can do it. And I never know what they're going to get excited about. Like one class might love something. I yeah. bring it back to the next group and they're just like yeah. crickets. You know, <laughs> we had an artist come in last week. Kate Aitchison from Bluff, Utah, and she makes her own paper. And we have some of the materials to do that, but I've never taught it. And now all the students in my printmaking class are like, we're making paper, yes. you know, and they're just so excited to do it. But in another group, if, if the, you know, set same idea of like, we're going to start this semester making paper, they're going to be like, but why, you know, and some of it is noticing in themselves, but sometimes it's seeing something in another student as well. That's why we like to share our sketchbooks. It's like, normally you don't share your sketchbook with other people, but we're kind of holding the space in the classroom where they know they're not being judged that they might not show someone, they might not show a relative or something, but they're going to show their yeah. classmates because they're going to see the potential in even an unfinished sketch or just the start of something where like, wow, I could see this becoming a painting or a print. And so it's, we're such a visual culture that I think that because of Pinterest and Instagram and TikTok, that we're all creators. We're all like content creators. And it's like, what is your thing? And you can cultivate that to be a way to express yourself. And, uh, it's, it's, um, you know, it's introducing something that I would thought as an obsolete technology. I'll introduce it in the class. Like we did ink painting yesterday in my drawing class. And a student said, I'm so excited to do this because this is something I've seen on YouTube. I always wondered how it was done. And now I get a chance to do it. I'm surprised because yeah. like something that I maybe would take for granted or something that I'm introducing as like an obsolete technology. that's like, boom, they've already seen it. Yeah. It's kind of that awareness is really interesting. Oh yeah, so with with nurturing creativity, how do you grade creativity? I mean, you you know, it's a it, this is a college. This is you, they, students take courses, they receive grades. That would seem to me be a, be a lot more challenging than say somebody in the Derby Building, and you know, you know, here's you know, you you take biology, you know it or you don't math it's right or it's wrong. How, how do you go about grading? Yeah. Art? It's like, you just kind of randomly go like <laughs> this and then, yeah. and then no, I said B. Really? It, yeah, it's... but don't give my secrets out. Hopefully no students <laughs> listen to this or watch this. No, it's, it's, again, it goes back to if I've been clear with what the assignment is, Yeah, they can even break the rules, right? They, if the, if the assignment is about create an image that uh, explores one of the seven principles of design mm -hmm. and it's through collage, but they 
end up painting a bunch of different things and then cut those up and recombine them in a new composition. Everyone else did a collage and they did this new thing. It's like Islam. And they said they were exploring economy or movement. They did it. They accomplished it. And that's measurable. That's an outcome, right? And if I'm clear with the assignment, which sometimes I'm not, or sometimes, you know, one, they might nail one assignment. The next one is more of a struggle, but there are certain things that we can look for. Was it yeah. well crafted? Mm-hmm. Was the technique there? Uh, did they think about the edge of the frame? Did right. they utilize some of the vocabulary? But I agree. Sometimes it is. It's very subjective. And I try to hold myself accountable. So right. I use a rubric and I'm trying to look for certain criteria. But at the end of the day, it's like, is the effort there? Is the intention right. there? I try to encourage students to break the rules all the time so that maybe it doesn't have to fit into this box that we're worried about grading because art is subjective and beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but there's so many different ways of doing it. And it's not just my way. That's the right way. Yeah. The, you know, with with teaching art, you know, I, and I'm trying to, it was like, oh gosh, like Dolly, you know, became, you know, later in his, his career, very surreal, uh, very surreal in what he did, but everybody would dismiss it as kind of, that's not, it's just cartoonish or whatever. And, uh, but then you look at his early work and he, he was very realistic, you know, I mean, he, and all of a sudden you just saw there was the discipline there that then allowed him to grow into his particular style. Is that a transition art that artists go through, or is that just me just thinking more in a linear way? Uh, you could use Picasso as an example yeah. too. Picasso, yeah. as a young artist, he was so adept at drawing at, at the age of thirteen that he was so good at drawing representationally that his father, who was an academic professor at an yeah. art school, quit and gave up because he's like, "I'll never be better than my son is now at age 13. <laughs> but he, <laughs> Picasso, walked so far away from right. representation yeah. that it didn't matter. Yeah. I don't know if there's uh, a great scene in the Wes Anderson film, The uh, French Dispatch. Yes. And he says, how do you know it's good modern art? I can't tell looking at it. It doesn't look like the thing. And he said, well, here's what we do. We look at a modern artist and we say, draw something that's real, like a bird. Yeah. And if they can draw a bird and it looks like a bird and they choose not to, wow, they're a really good artist. Yeah. Like they're breaking the rules. They're breaking the conventions. Yeah, it was I just the think homicidal it's a homicidal funny... prisoner. That yeah. Yeah. And, and when and he finally Del Toro. Did, yeah. He finally did the mural, but he did on the prison he's wall. Like, he's like, why <laughs> on the wall? Yeah. We can move those. But yeah, yeah, it's just, it is so true because sometimes students will be, I'm an abstract artist, yes. right? And a lot of my work isn't representational. And then sometimes when they'll find out that I can actually, you can actually draw, you actually draw right, as right. well. That shouldn't be the measure, right? But Salvador Dali, I think is an interesting case where it became, it, it sort of became that, uh, that analogy that you had to be this really almost tormented genius yeah. that nobody else would understand. And you have this unique kind of visionary way of looking at the world, but it's still incremental. It's still, he right. was inspired by the artists around him. He was inspired by um, some really interesting theories of, you know, psychology, Lacan and Freud and current French events, current too. events, yeah. the war and yeah. and French poets and philosophers so he was like really a sponge. And so I don't think it was that he was representational and moved away from it because he was just so unique and so gifted. If he would have done that a hundred years earlier, would have fallen on deaf ear. Yeah. It was because that the times were changing so much and things were tumultuous that that's what people wanted to see. Yeah. Today, he would probably be like Banksy and doing something completely different and graffiti on walls and you know maybe doing a digital thing it's just it's what yeah. it speaks to the time well, banks is right brilliant i uh, my daughter and i went to the museum in new york that you know of his art and it's you know it's political it's creative it's, exactly. it's multimedia i mm-hmm. i always just mm-hmm. thought of him as being just simply you know just uh graffiti like what well, called graffiti art or yeah whatever, but, yeah uh, with so much more definitely had a lot of installations yeah. and- yes <laughs> to veer off a little bit <laughs> <laughs> with uh, with um, uh, it's Banksy, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, like you said, political, artistic, amazing, right? Uh, how I don't know if you know, but how do you feel about him shredding I his most infamous uh painting? It's brilliant because it went up to like what, like 
something, something billion. And as soon as it was sold, he shredded it. Yeah. I think it was brilliant. It was, it was actually set and they don't know for sure how he did it. It was set to like when the gavel hit that it was sold, that that piece started to shred and everyone thought it was a stunt in the room that it was like people gasped, like, is, did that just really happen? But it was supposed to go all the way through, but it stopped for some reason halfway it, it uh, malfunctioned. And I think that made it a way more interesting piece. Mm-hmm. It was sort of like when an artist sells a piece, they're giving up control of it in a way and it becomes something else. Someone else owns it, and especially with his work, too, because he's anonymous. That that was just a great metaphor for that that work truly being destroyed, but it became more valuable too, yeah, which I think yeah. was just a stroke of genius. That's a brilliant piece. I think it's really clever, unique, and uh, it's a critique on the market, the art market. But it also shows, as an artist, you know, you can be innovative, creative, and kind of again be subversive, kind of mess with the system. But at the same time, he's getting paid. Yeah, he got his. Yeah, there you, you go. Yeah, he cashed the check. Yeah, <laughs> well, thank you. You know, in your creative journey, you've done residencies, you know, like in a lot of interesting places. Mark Mark Rothko in Italy, several places in the U.S. Kind of explain. You did your of, research. I, you did we, your research. I didn't even just. Worked. I didn't send you my bio. You didn't even ask. You didn't say what. What do I need to say for my bio? Dude, you did your work. Prof- we're professionals. professionals yes. Clearly, so, yeah. clearly. But, but on your creative journey, how, you know, you know did, how did that help you in terms of kind of, you know, evolve your craft or, you know, just learn from others? Kind of what's even the benefit of residencies for you? I think that doing art is very introspective and it's soul searching and you're kind of having a conversation with mm-hmm. yourself. And when you do a residency, which I've been fortunate to do a number of them, and especially when it's like an international one and there's going to be other people there as well, it becomes still that internal conversation with multiple people present. And then you realize that the things that you're working on, working towards that you feel like are very maybe personal and unique are shared and Mm -hmm. become a little more universal, but also really increases the networking opportunity. I've met great friends, uh, Going, I'm going to Argentina over spring break. Carly and I oh. are going to do a residency yeah. at uh, Ray Dahl. It's in uh, Bariloche, Argentina. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. And while I'm there, I also want to go to Buenos Aires. So while we're there, we're going to yeah. piggyback and go spend a few days there. And, and, and we're going to visit an artist that I met at a residency in 2018 yeah. at the Vermont Studio Center. It's just nice knowing that you have peers colleagues, friends, artists all over the globe. Yeah. And so when you go visit a place, I did the Mark Rothko residency in 2019. That yeah. was a definitely like a pinch myself moment. I applied thinking like this is, you know, would be yeah. unreal, like a dream country. Mark Rothko, modern artist, known for his color fields, just really, I think he's like, uh, can can be somewhat contentious as an artist, some people either get it or they don't, but it's, I think it's really simple to understand. Like it's yeah. maybe a, some people think it's like, uh, I don't get it. I don't understand. It's like really about the experience, but he's always been a big influence and and huge hero of mine. So when I have had the opportunity to apply, I thought I'll, maybe I'll keep right. applying, 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 and maybe eventually do this. And I got accepted. So they, they asked 10 artists globally to come right. and live in residence in this museum. I was on the second floor of the museum and on the first floor below me, are six Mark Rothko paintings. Wow. And you're okay. you're yeah. working in this environment. It was in an old um, Napoleonic citadel that was built in the early uh, 19th century, but it wasn't yeah. finished until after yeah. the Napoleonic War, so like maybe 1820s. And this space was beautiful, and they converted it to a museum. It had been disused during the Soviet era. Latvia got its independence, and it was kind of abandoned. The Rothko family and the state of Latvia – uh, funded this to become a museum for the Baltics, for artists in the Baltics, but also dedicated to Mark Rothko, who was born in Dogapuls, Latvia. And so they always have six pieces there. They, they switch it out every year or two, and they the, the Rothko family puts these new paintings in. And so I was literally like eating, dreaming, sleeping Rothko 24-7. Just an amazing opportunity. But you're supposed to be inspired by his work in the landscape and the environment where he grew up and make art. And then so as an opportunity... I got to work there and make art. 
Right. You know, and kind of like I already think like my art is sometimes a bad rip off of Mark Rothko. And now here it's like they're like, here's canvas, here's paint. Yeah. What's your version of Rothko? And I'm like, I'm already like ripping them off. Like this yeah, seems yeah. really weird. But it was just a once in a lifetime opportunity. And as a result, uh, three of my paintings became part of the collection at the oh, Rothko wow. Museum, That's which is really, cool. really cool. Now, is that one of the prints that, that yes, I bought? Yes. Well, yeah. While okay. I was there, yeah. I made these large paintings. They're about right. three and a half by five feet. I made right. four. Didn't really want to. When you're there, it culminates in an exhibition, right. and they ask for a few pieces to mm -hmm. become part of the collection in exchange for doing this residency for free and uh, being selected for this. And so I donated three to the collection. And then the fourth one I donated to the library. But while I was there, that's in that region. Mm -hmm. And then while I was there, I did want to bring some work back that I kind of saw as studies and could become future projects. And here we're in 2024. You just bought one of these pieces. It's yeah. in the Lion Building. And I'm now still making some artwork that's directly influenced by those pieces that I made there. So just really inspirational, influential, and wow. keeps going. You know, with our residencies and, 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 and the collaborations you talk about, it seems with artists, they are more um, supportive and collaborative versus competitive, you know, and I, I don't know if that would be the same in all creative fields. It seems your experience, everybody is kind of helping and Yes and no. Okay, yes and no. Tell us. Yeah, I had, I had a. We want to hear scandal. <laughs> <laughs> I had a different experience. Yeah. Growing up and and in high school and an undergraduate, mm -hmm. even in grad school, that sometimes it was like the mentors felt like they were uh, challenging their students and right. and pushing them, but it became very antagonistic, threatened, mm. Def defend like in the yeah. so Socratic position, yeah, yeah, you know, system to like defend your work, mm -hmm. but if you're always defending your work. Instead of like just seeking answers about your work, like, right. hey, I'm asking you what this is like. Well, no, you tell me what you're trying to do. Right. And if you're always defending your work, it seems negative, right? Yeah. It can be negative. Yeah. And so I had some bad experiences and I had some, I had some great professors, but who mm -hmm. were also really not that kind and not as nurturing or also living in bigger markets that I felt sometimes that artists were more cutthroat right. and very protective. Yeah. I've got my thing. You've got yours. Let's like keep right. it separate. But in Arkansas, I felt the opposite. Yeah. That Arkansas artists have been very supportive, generous. Hey, I'm doing this thing. I think you should do it as well. There's this opportunity. Why don't you apply for this? Right. And there's a lot of that that happens in printmaking organically because you're used to working in a print studio mm -hmm. where you're working right next to someone. You might literally have to collaborate with them, going to the press, working on something. And maybe some, like a sculptor or a painter, might not have that same uh, natural like sort of uh, synergy. But so I've tried to model myself as a professor, and I don't know that I'm necessarily achieving it, right. but that is more, um, you know, seeing the potential, the positive aspect being, uh, hey, this is learning and this is the trust the process yeah. and more of trying to encourage and, and develop that, like, uh, as opposed to antagonistic and, and being really, you know, like forceful or yeah, yeah. coming down. Yeah. Uh, technology, you know, how... How is technology impacting art? You know, as far as where, where do you see it, technology taking art like in the future? Yeah, I think that that becomes a question of who's using the technology yeah. and how they're using it. One of our alums, McKinley Street, who graduated in 2019, mm -hmm. was uh, on did a study abroad in Japan and also did a trip to Italy and then went on to school at the Florence. Institute and then Whoa. and now is at grad school at, at the College of Art in Rome, mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, in Paris College of Art, and uh, said, you know, I know how to paint, and I can paint on my own, and I know how to do printmaking, and I can draw. I don't know digital art. Yeah. I'm going to go to graduate school for digital art. I thought, well, that's really brave. That's really ambitious. Yeah. But using digital art in a way that, like, uh, she was doing these drawings that she taught a robot how to make a drawing. It was kind of really interesting, right? And then the robot could do the drawing for her, and it would look exactly like she wanted it to. But then she would mess with the robot so that it made a drawing that was more human. 
that was that was more like yeah. what she would make. And she would even like, as the robot was drawing, move the paper. So she's doing these like generative, they're almost like prints and it's almost in her own handwriting then instead of the robot's handwriting as like an artist. And so Marcus, it's- Marcus Bergencraw is having a smile on his face. <laughs> he doesn't know why. <laughs> <laughs> he would love to. It, it's, yeah. it's like uh, the, the moment we know yeah. the capabilities and the applications of a computer is when I think young artists aren't interested in it anymore. Yeah. But instead, it's like, that's when I think they become more interested in like, like for instance, stone lithography. It's really mm-hmm. outdated. It's obsolete. It isn't taught as much anymore. Stones are unwieldy. They're about this thick and you grain them. And yeah. I to- was telling my students about them and showing them some of the prints. And mm-hmm. I showed them what an actual stone looks like. They want to do it. Even though like now we could just do it digitally and print it and it looks the same, but like, no, they yeah. want to know how to do that because no one else is doing it. It's kind of like a secret. So I kind of think that part of it is we're always using technology, right. but we're trying to use it as a tool creatively. And I'm probably the worst person to ask yeah. because the way that I'm using it is in yeah. such a limited way right. that yeah. I want to introduce it as a tool. So even in the class 2D design that I teach, most of the things we're learning how to do design-wise is how designers, graphic designers, artists have been making art and graphic design for hundreds of years right. and pre-computer. But we can also do it on the computer. So any project, they they could do hands-on, drawing it, collage, painting it. They could also do it digitally. Yeah. And you'd be surprised because some students who think that they're really good at digital art, maybe they've only done things on their iPad and they've used Procreate, but they've never used Illustrator. They've never used right. Photoshop and, and it's uncomfortable and it's new and it's a challenge, but then they gain so much confidence that they know how to do it that way on a computer versus on their screen. I think there's, what do you think? I think there's a little bit of a resistance right now to, to, to young students and, and screens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can agree with you on that. Like us old farts are like, we're going to do this, but we're going to do it on the computer. We're going to use technology. Isn't that cool? And students are like, cool. Yeah. But I've been doing that for the last 15 years. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I can agree with you on that. I feel like, well, I feel like there's like just a split, like a divide. Cause I feel like with um, graphic design, like on a computer, like you said, I think some people like the, younger like younger than me are more adapt to be like yeah let me go do it on a computer let me go do this let me draw right here let me see how it looks on here whereas people like around my age just more like you said pen and pencil like let yeah. me draw it first like because with me when i was doing like i said i bring it up again the hoodie when i was a hoodie i didn't touch a computer like i didn't touch Good a computer yeah, i was drawing it out i was trying yeah. to see how to do it and uh i believe i believe it was nicola at the time and nicola was like do you want me to just like Type it up and like show you on the computer. I was like, oh, no, let, me, let me draw it first. <laughs> well, do this. How it is. So yeah. I think there's a there's a divide, and I think it I think it fluctuates sometimes. I think, like I said, my generation is more pen and paper. Um, the younger generation is more okay. Let me do it on the computer. I feel like it's gonna go back to pen and paper, and I think it's gonna that retro aspect, that yeah. nostalgia. So I think it's gonna fluctuate. Yeah, because I'll show both approaches, and there's some students that will gravitate to doing things digitally is because they haven't before. Mm-hmm. And the students that generally have done more digitally and maybe even do some things like they're freelancing and doing some graphic design on their own, they're like, let me try this now hands on Mm -hmm. because they've already done that. They've learned that. And it's like, I want to see this new tool. I want to see this more, maybe more traditional approach to doing it. There's just so many tricks and tips that we can show. And and you could learn one thing in 15 minutes and spend a career Mm -hmm. exploring that and vice versa. You could be, you know, spending so much time learning all these different things, but you've never really truly used how, learned how to use them or show them in a visual way. Yeah. Uh, quite just a general question. What do people get right and what do people get wrong about art? Yeah, I think but, um, there's this huge misconception that art has to be understood. Mm-hmm. That it's for tell, that, that it's only tell. for like an enlightened, educated individual that they know what they're looking at. So like they're they go intimidated to, when they walk up, and they're supposed to know that it's the abyss and the meaningless of not life. And all, but when it's <laughs> that just, sounds it, brilliant. You need to come <laughs> help me write my artist statement. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, no, that's like that, that's like Rothko too. Right. You know, I think that it. You know, his idea was the the picture was. The experience, you know, pe- people Just think that a lot of times the experience becomes the picture right. and that that's a representation of the experience. And his idea was like, no, the picture is the experience. 
Like if you just let yourself turn over to that artwork, turn yourself over to it and just take it in, right. you're going to understand it. Like a lot of times, even two people with my art, they'll say like, well, I, it looks nice. It's interesting. Right. It's, it, it, it's, I like the color. I like the shape, maybe some of the patterns that are in it, but I don't understand it. Right. I don't get it. But I think that abstract art is probably the easiest art to understand. It doesn't have to necessarily, it could right. have a particular meaning or maybe the artist was trying to conjure up the abyss or the yeah. sublime or some sure, greater yeah. theme. But also I think if you enjoy the colors and like the pattern right. and the shape and you want to live with it, that that, then you do understand it, right? You're getting the idea. Nobody listens to a song and says, eh, I didn't really understand the song. Is that really a song? Yeah. Is that music? No, they'll be like, I just don't like that particular they, they song. Like, yeah, they, they, or they feel the song yeah. and they say like, that song resonates with me. Yeah. They might be in another language. It might not even have lyrics. Or if you say like, you know, this uh, Stravinsky song is about spring. Like, really? How is that about spring? It's all like all these like passages and movements. But yeah. then you listen to it and you're like, you know what? I saw the today walking by the daffodils, saw them blossoming and saw the crepe myrtles, the white yeah. blooming. And then I listened to Stravinsky and it's like, you took me there. Like, there maybe it does. Yes. You know, it's kind of it's kind of like we find our own meaning in it. But also with what people get wrong is that technical acuity means yeah. masterpiece, right? I think yeah. that's why students sometimes lack confidence. Like they say, I can't draw because someone else made a masterpiece shouldn't get in the way of you making a masterpiece. It's going to be different. And that's good. You should celebrate that, right? Yeah. Because so many times people think they can't do it. Right. I was telling my drawing class the other day, don't apologize for yourself. It doesn't look like the way that you wanted it to. I don't, you could take a photograph. But what is interesting about the way that it's expressive? Yeah. What do you? What were you able to do? What were you able to accomplish that we're now looking at and we're enjoying? Maybe it doesn't look exactly like you wanted to. Now, that doesn't mean just throw anything at the wall and see what sticks. Mm -hmm. But we could imagine a scenario in which we draw something in five seconds and it's amazing. Right. Five minutes, it's amazing. We could also imagine a scenario where it took us five hours to draw something and it looks terrible, right? So why do we beat ourselves up if it if it isn't like... I think the myth is that art continued to get better and better and better and better and then fell off yeah. and it's judged by technical acuity. And I think right. rather it should be judged by if you enjoy it. Yeah. Just like I like that song and I don't have to think about if it's actually music or not. I love it. Uh, this is a podcast about careers, uh, kind of you're an art major. What career paths are available for students who major in art what career paths aren't available for students who major well in said arts? all right mm, Keep, okay. uh, <laughs> no really no. seriously yeah. i mean there's just so many different directions and I, i've had a lot of students go on in successful careers and some seem very intuitive for mm -hmm. artists like art teacher graphic designer right. marketer you know social media content creator but then there's atypical ones as well um haley cormican who graduated in uh, 2021, graduated from the, you know, Clinton school and right. is working for the state uh, and, and helping to develop things that draw on both an interest in communication, language, English, but also, you know, visual aspects too, like understanding systems and how to get people to be on the same page as you. Uh, I think that there are a lot more careers now that we define as creative fields. Right. And there was a study in 2016 that IBM did that they always ask CEOs, what are you looking for most yeah. in, in potential hirees? And they said creativity, right. right? That that's something very nebulous too that we don't necessarily teach or we think is difficult. It's a moving target. How do you teach how to be creative? It's hard to statistically analyze yeah. you know that you are creative or you're not creative but you know when you're good at problem solving right you know when you can come up with a logo and and a client likes it mm -hmm. or not or whether the colors are wrong in a room those are all things that are tangible that you can learn by being an artist or an art student or an art major so there are those types of careers that or like uh chin yi chu who graduated from lion in 2017 she graduated in 2017 she graduated no in 2015 right and 
works for Google now. Yeah. Got to create her own title oh, as well. Like, right. you know, you're doing pretty well, at Google, and, and yeah. she's at the, you know, yeah. but they higher but level because yeah, it's just that you know, she has a psychology and art thing. degree yeah. from a liberal arts institution, yeah. you know, and she's and they and they want to use her talents for creativity and for diversity yeah. initiatives, and it's like that is the power of a liberal arts degree right there because we can teach anyone. I'm not knocking any of the data science or, or computer science folks. We can teach anyone to to code if that's important. We can teach anyone to give them a style guide and say, hey, we want you to write this way. We can right. we can teach anyone to do that, but can we teach anyone to be creative? So they, their thinking is if we're getting people who are collaborators, who are work, good at working in teams, who are good – creativity um you know developing creativity in right. others then that's very employable we've had a lot of students go into arts administration mm -hmm. we've had uh someone work at crystal bridges who's now the educate the director of education at the dayton art institute matt boyd he was my very first class was also a teak oh, yeah. graduated in 2012 when i came on in 2010 it, he had just transferred in so we started this the very same year at lyon he went to Cranbrook, which is one of the best art in schools Michigan, yeah. in Michigan, one of the best art schools in the country, if not the world. And uh, Francis Winfrey, who's gone on and done things in arts administration and, and development as well. And also students doing things in art therapy. So combining psychology and art like Victoria Hutchison, who graduated and is now our director of uh, health and behavioral health at Lyon. We'll stick with that, yeah. But yeah, but man, I mean, she was also real heavily involved in the murals, right? Yeah, she yeah. was in that first class, the first yeah. group that started the murals, and we started that in 2018. And she graduated in 2019. She helped with the Coca-Cola mural in yep. town. She did the Protect mural. And then she had an opportunity when she graduated. We got a lot of coverage for that yeah. Coca-Cola mural. It was really cool. There was probably 300 people from the city. And the local area that came out to the ribbon cutting when we finished the Coca-Cola mural, finished restoring that. It was really neat. And uh, the mayor came out. The chamber did a, like a little time lapse of it. It was really fun. But when she graduated, she had an opportunity before she went to graduate school at Florida State to do a couple of murals in Missouri. And then another one of our students moved back home to California. And from her attention on doing murals, she started doing them out there. And, and then, uh, you know, Sonoma, Napa Valley area. And oh, yeah. You can make a career just full-time. They pay really well. Sometimes a mural can pay $10,000, $20,000, depending on the size. A lot of heavy lifting, though. I mean, yeah, you're doing yeah. like a, a mural three stories tall. You need a lift. Yeah. But, yeah, so there's a lot of opportunities. I think that there's a lot of transferable and applicable skills, soft skills that you learn in art, patience, time management, being able to focus wouldn't it be great if everyone entering the workforce was detail oriented and could focus yeah. on a task from the process of coming up with the idea to ideation to execution? We learn those things in art classes, very, right? Yeah. Very tangible products that, that they produce. Well, perfect. I think that is a perfect way to end. How we podcast. do on time? Producer Jason. 48 minutes and 30 minutes. Is that a new record? No. No. <laughs> No. What's the yeah. longest? Funny enough, Abigail texted me with our longest an hour and twenty. I believe it. I believe it. She's but, always but got great things to say. We, we, we have everything from sports. Well, it was everything lard. from basketball, lard? to lard, aspic. Get out of here. Uh, yeah, what? Yeah, yeah. yeah well, I, I feel random. like I let y'all down. Then <laughs> we didn't talk about any of the good stuff. It was all, it was <laughs> thanks all good for, on this end. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for the opportunity. It's great chatting with y'all. Well, thank you, Dustin, and and uh, thank you all for listening to the Career Pathways podcast. As always, we're every Monday we're going to have a new episode. So signing us off, Gavin Brunson, and and thank you, Dustin Bork. Peace. All right, take care. This broadcast is sponsored in part by Lion College and by Kilt Studios.